In today's video, we're going to revisit lighting from Photo 1. We're going to actually look at a few more advanced lighting setups uh, that can help you create more interesting imagery. We're going to focus primarily on the figure uh, in these examples, uh, but you could apply this to pretty much anything you want to light to get a better uh, or more interesting uh, lighting for your object. So we need to sort of look at some old terms and actually add some terms uh, to things that we talked about in photo one. We talked a little bit about existing light or the available light, but this is light that's already present at the scene of your photograph. So if you guys are going outside to photograph the sun, whether it's behind clouds or whether it's out, um, you could technically use the moon, the stars, any kind of light that's there. Also, light fixtures that are actually part of the room that you're in. So, for example, in the classroom, the fluorescent lights that are in the room, that's considered existing light because it's light that's already there. Yeah, we can turn it on and off and control it, but you can't move it around. Um, so, we also need to talk about natural light, um, which is just the sun and the moon or the stars, uh, and then artificial light being man-made light. When we talk about existing light, we use that a lot with um, starlight. We get what are called star trails, which you see here. Uh, and basically, this is an image that was taken outside of this lighthouse, uh, actually at night. And what you're seeing is very much like we talked about uh, just recently with motion. You're actually tracking the motion of the stars. So each of those little streaks there is actually a star and you're seeing the rotation of the Earth. What this photographer did is they lined the North Star up uh, behind that lighthouse, the light in the lighthouse, uh, set their camera on a tripod, and then set for, you know, eight, nine, ten minute, maybe half hour exposure, uh, and let it go. The longer you let those go, the longer your trails will be. Um, you can actually set these where you're setting for almost as much darkness as there is, and you'll get an almost complete circle. Uh, there are people that have set these up at the North or South Pole during the winter months when the sun really never rises, and you can almost make complete circles, um, tra track the st actual star the whole way around uh, one rotation of the Earth, so a 24-hour exposure. The other thing that we can do with existing light um, is playing around with this idea of light writing. Here, uh, you have a person with a sparkler, and they're actually writing with it. You hold the exposure open until they've done their little writing thing, and then you let the exposure um, go, uh, and you end up, it will record where the light is. Because that light is very powerful, you can see the people sort of in the background there that are um, lit by this single light source. Uh, but it gives you that illusion of that they are actually lighting, uh, writing with light. So that's something to play around with, but just a way of looking at neat ways to play with existing light. We talk about studio light or artificial light. Um, this is light that you're bringing into the scene to bo boost or control the lighting of that scene. Again, if you have fluorescent lights overhead, you may bring in more lights um, in the art rooms we have the incandescent spotlights we could have those on but then also bring in additional spotlights uh, to make the room uh, brighter uh, but also as a way of controlling where the light is um, you guys in photo one played around with the studio light uh, the silver light setups um, you can use your desk for this you can come in and use my lights um, but it's anything that you can control uh, of course the artificial light is anything that you're bringing into the scene um, it can be as simple as a single flash, or it can be complex as a multiple um, light setup, which we're going to talk about. We also need to differentiate uh, between, uh, with artificial light, two different ways of getting light. A continuous light is a steady, uninterrupted light. Um, so like from a light bulb, electric light source, a light bulb, the lighting that you used in photo one would have been a continuous light source. The other type of artificial light then would be the flash. And the flash is a light source, obviously, that it's a powerful single burst um, that the camera syncs with the shutter. Uh, I don't really want you using flash now, but if you can detach the flash from your camera and fire it remotely, you can actually use the flash like uh, you would use your um, 
the, the studio lights that we were using in Photo One. If you're more interested in that and you have the right equipment, we can look at playing with your flash as a directional light source. But again, you have to have a special flash for that. So what I'd like you guys to do um, after you're done watching this video is actually go through. Uh, there's a PDF on Classroom that has these images as well. Um, and I want you to play around with these different types of lights. Um, so some are very simple. In this case, it's a uh, front light. And basically, I'm putting that light directly at the person's face. Um, maybe just a little bit off to the side. So I get a tiny little bit of shadow. But you'll notice in both images, uh, the, the model's faces are fairly flat. Uh, when you look at the gentleman's face on the right there, uh, it's very... Um, brightly lit there's not a ton of definition to his face like the dimensionality of it um, so we really only would use front lighting um, as an example of um, you know what not to do um, or if you really don't want to notice you know, if I want to if I have a really big nose and I don't want people to see it if I use front lighting I can make my nose look smaller um, so you do kind of sometimes use it but it's really a uh, a way of flattening your subject's face or your object We've already played around with side lighting. This is what in photo one we called 90 degree. Um, and you can see in the description under side lighting on the right there, they call this hatchet. Um, that's why I always use the example if I put an ax in your face, um, that half of it should be lit, half should be uh, in shadow. High side, light, high side lighting um, is basically what we called 45, but they actually, in these instances, bring the light higher than the model. So not only is it the 45 degree where the apple of the cheek uh, is lit, but they actually raise the light a little bit more. What that does is elongates the shadow of the nose um, a little bit, and again, just adds to that dimensionality. Um, it gives you more of a natural look that your light sources are usually higher than you. Um, so it gives you a more sort of natural looking light. Um, but again, this is very close to what we did with 45. Uh, top lighting, now we're getting into ones that you're using to create effects. Um, in this case, we put the light directly over top of. Uh, so you may need somebody to help you hold your light up that high. Uh, and you can see in both models' faces, the light is really accentuating the eye sockets. And so you get almost like a skull look to it. Uh, it really starts to be kind of creepy looking uh, in both of these. It almost blacks out the eyes totally. So again, you'd be using this for an effect, a dramatic effect. Probably the most recognizable um, is the ghoul lighting or what we call under lighting. And this is putting your light source directly under the person's face, aimed up at their face. If you've ever been camping and you've told ghost stories around the campfire, you probably have seen or done yourself put the flashlight under your face to make it even more intense. Again, this is totally an effect lighting. None of you are going to go do portraiture this way. The other one that we always talk about in photo one when your light source is in your picture is this concept of backlighting. In both of these cases, the light is directly behind your subject's uh, head, so you just get that halo outline. If you're doing backlighting correctly outside, you'll actually get imagery uh, where your subject is in silhouette and all of the colors and the normal values are in the background. Um, so let's take a look at a couple of those if you wanted to try playing around with naturally backlit stuff, which a bunch of you have tried before. Uh, in this instance, this is a horrible one. This is a horrible light merger. My light source is not hidden by my subject here. So you get those rays of light. Now you may use this for some kind of an effect, um, but it's not good backlighting. It's actually uh, a, a photograph that hasn't been composed uh, quite right. This is what a backlit subject should look like. So you have the three people standing with uh, facing the, the sunrise or the sunset here. Um, the sun is directly behind the man that's standing. Uh, and you see that they're in silhouette. I barely can see uh, information on them. I can tell there's some kind of design on the man's hat. Um, and the person that's sitting low uh, seems to have some kind of like a head wrap or a hood over their head. Um, but I really can't see a lot of information in them. This is what backlighting should look like. 
One of the other things that we need to talk about then is this multi-light setup. And the only reason you really need to know this is if you're ever going to do true portrait photography. Um, for example, like for your school portraits, your senior portraits, um, what they use for the yearbook, they're using this multi-light setup. So we start with your main 45 degree light. Get that set up basically like we would have in photo one with uh, 45. We bring in that second light uh, that ends up softening uh, the shadow part. So you can see that her face has sort of lit, in, lit up uh, in the shadow side. And then we add one more light. And this one is actually one that doesn't always make sense to people. Uh, but this is actually a light that is aimed at your background. And what that does is it separates your model's uh, hair uh, and head from their background and so it makes them stick out a little bit more in this case they're using just a white background in our back black background setup in the classroom um, it actually does help to separate uh, people with dark hair from that dark background um, so you guys want to practice this one you will be required to set the three lights up uh, and I have that set up in the classroom um, if you need all of those lights one other thing we need to talk about is this concept of reflectors. So reflectors can actually be used as a way of, if I don't have enough light, um, to actually create a second uh, light without having a light bulb. So here you can see a picture of the pot in the top left was taken with just the single light source. It's super dramatic. I lose details in the bottom of the shadows and I can't quite tell what that thing is uh, in the lower left hand corner in front of the teapot. So by taking a reflector, which is simply a, a piece of white cardboard, a white painted piece of plywood, uh, you can actually buy reflectors um, that are sort of like a, a shiny silver color. Um, you put that behind your subject and then you re-photograph it and you can see uh, on the bottom right uh, picture that same teapot now looks like it's been lit from multiple light sources. Um, I still have value to it. I can tell that the pot is round, but now I can actually tell that this is a picture of a teapot and I have a pile of tea leaves in the middle. Um, and then the, the silver ball looking thing, sphere looking thing is actually um, a diffuser, a tea diffuser. So you put the tea in that, put it in the teapot and it'll keep the, the tea from uh, spreading all over in the pot. So by using that reflector, I've taken a single light and, and turned it into a second light. You also may have seen this if you've ever watched um, when they do like the swimsuit edition for Sports Illustrated. If you see people out on the beach taking pictures, there's always some guy standing there or uh, an, a girl assistant um, that has a big shiny reflector. They're actually using that reflector as a second light and the sun as the main light source. So that reflector gives you... Um, the ability uh, to get a second light source without actually having to buy a light. There's a second type of uh, reflector that's a black reflector. And this is simply used when you're photographing something clear. So in this glass, we have a fish floating. Um, if we didn't have those black reflectors on the sides, that glass would disappear into the background. So by having these black reflectors, I'm actually using that to help define the edge of something that really doesn't have um, color in it. Uh, again, reflectors are just there so that you know about them. You don't have to use them. Um, you can play around with them if you'd like. And I actually have a couple reflectors that you can use um, if you need to. So a couple things we need to look over here real quick. Um, if you don't know how to read your camera's light meter, this is probably something that you and I need to sit down and make sure you know how to read it. Um, lighting sometimes is a little bit easier to shoot on a manual setting so that you can end up adjusting and lying to your camera to get a little bit more of a dramatic effect. Um, do you have multiple light sources that you can try and set all of these lighting schemes uh, up at home? Or are you going to have to use my lighting for like the multi-light one? Um, which is perfectly fine, but you need to bring your own subject um, to photograph for that. Uh, if you don't know, how, uh, where, if you have these lights, uh, we can also talk about signing them out. Although I'm a little leery of sending uh, lights home because of bulbs breaking. Um, so we can talk about that if you don't have access to all of that. For the shooting assignment itself, um, you're going to continue to explore compositional. 
uh, and lighting techniques from photo one, you're now going to concentrate on light uh, and the effect it has on your subject again. Um, so you're going to be looking at those uh, light schemes on the handouts uh, and play around with those. So you have five required uh, images for this. A well-composed and executed 90 or 45 studio or natural lit. I don't care uh, which you do. You do not have to have both. Um, you need to give me an example of well-composed and executed backlit subject, whether that's done with a studio light or if you go out and try and do it outside. Uh, an example of a well-composed and executed multiple lit subject, um, that's the three light setup that we talked about uh, towards the end of the lighting setup. Um, you need to have a well-composed ghoul lit uh, subject to play around with the ghoul lighting. Um, and then uh, you need to come up with a well-composed and executed lit subject um, that's your choice studio or naturally lit. And you can't repeat any of the four uh, schemes that were required so far. You must take 24 exposures for this one total. Um, anything you take in class for the activity can't count. You must bring something else in to do again. Again, think about compositional techniques um, from photo one and things that we've uh, dealt with this uh, semester so far. Um, you don't have to have them in every image. You guys know the way that this runs. You're going to be able to crop. You want to try and compose as much as you can in the camera. It'll save you some time, uh, and you can use Photoshop uh, to adjust everything else that you need to. Um, and then uh, what I'm going to be looking for, again, that 45 or 90, the studio or naturally lit, um, the bat lit subject, uh, the multiple lit subject, the ghoul lit subject, um, and then uh, the one more that's not any of those first four. So if you do 90 degree uh, in the first one there, you could do 45 for the other. That 90 and 45 in the backlit can be studio or naturally lit. Uh, the ghoul light and the multiple light uh, have to be studio lit. There's no way for you to do ghoul lighting with a natural light source. Um, so you can think about those. Um, you'll see the rubric next week when your negatives are due to see um, what I'm looking for in the finals. So what I'd like you to do now is go over to the other room. Um, or, I'm sorry, work in, in the room. Um, use the PDF. Uh, you can bring it up on somebody's Chromebook, have it near the light sources, grab your cameras. Um, and I actually want you to recreate all of the lighting schemes it talks about. Take a picture, each of you, for each um, of those schemes. Um, and then make sure you show them to me at some point so I know that you understand what you're going after. All right, go ahead and practice.